In the last session, we looked at the introductory questions concerning the Gospel of Luke. In particular, we examined the structure of Luke Acts. We saw the centrality of Jerusalem in the theology of Luke Acts. Then we examined the theme of journey as a major component of the Gospel of Luke. A discussion of the themes of faith and prayer followed, and we concluded the session with a look at the themes of conversion, repentance, and grace. In the current session, we will begin to look at the actual text of the Gospel of Luke, examining the prologue. Then we shall turn to a more in-depth analysis of the structure of the infancy narrative and conclude the session with a study of the section of the infancy narrative known as the Announcement Triptych, which consists of the announcement of the birth of John the Baptist, the announcement of the birth of Jesus, and the visitation. Finally, we will look at the story of the birth of John the Baptist. Luke is the only canonical gospel to begin with a prologue, which is similar to the formal literary prologues used by the Hellenistic writers of his day. This prologue prefaces the gospel, dedicating it to a certain Theophilus. In this preface, we're giving a hint as to what Luke's purpose and method are in writing his gospel, in particular, for whom the gospel was written. It is to be noted that in this prologue, Luke states, in many and varied ways, that what he is about to set forth is reliable. His sources are reliable, and he has checked for himself what they have told him for their reliability. And finally, he writes that Theophilus, his patron, may know the truth, the reliability, of what, has been, of what he has been told. Luke thus writes not merely to inform, but to inspire faith. So, let's begin with Luke's method. Put plainly, Luke intends to reflect on the present, that is, his own times in the 80s, about 50 years after the time of Christ, in light of the words of Jesus spoken during his lifetime, these words have been transmitted by eyewitnesses and have become almost enshrined in tradition, the handing on of these sayings, and they have been articulated according to the developing written texts, the scriptures. It is clear that 50 years after the experience of Jesus, the accounts of his words and deeds are something which the communities of his followers hold in very high esteem. This method is best seen in the prologue of the Gospel of Luke, Luke 1, 1 to 4. The first two verses of the prologue refer to the past. During the immediate past years, many have sought to compile a narrative which gives some order to the events concerning Jesus that have borne fruit in the Lucan community. Among these many would be the author of the Gospel of Mark, and perhaps Luke's contemporary, the author of the Gospel of Matthew, to name a few. These events have been preserved through the decades by eyewitnesses, who themselves have become ministers of the word, the foremost of whom are the apostles. The second two verses of the prologue refer to the present situation of Luke. Luke is neither an eyewitness to the events of Jesus, nor a minister of the word. Rather, he has studied the events and the sayings in the life of Jesus from the beginning, as they were handed on, to verify as well as possible the reliability of those traditions. Having done that, he now sits down to write an orderly account of the events that have inspired faith, in particular the faith of one Theophilus. Why does he do this? Well, that Theophilus, his patron, may know the asphaleia, the certainty, the truth, of what he has been informed concerning Jesus. We slipped in a Greek word here, as I will from time to time, to enhance the understanding of the Greek text. 
it is the word asphaleia, which is translated truth here. However, that's not the ordinary word used for truth in the Gospels. It is truth in the sense of firmness, security, or safety. In other words, it's a truth that has a solid foundation, verified by Luke, which guarantees that faith in it will be safe and secure. This is what Luke hopes for Theophilus, for his readers, and ultimately for us. The text now moves into the first main part of the Gospel, which, as in all Gospels, is an explanation of who this Jesus of Nazareth really is. In Luke, this explanation is composed of two major parts. The infancy narrative, from ver chapter 1, verse 5, to chapter 2, verse 52, and the account of the early ministry of Jesus, chapter 3, verse 1, to chapter 4, verse 30. The infancy narrative, and to a certain degree the narrative of the early ministry, is composed of parallel narratives concerning John the Baptist and Jesus, to which have been added a third narrative. Thus, Brown, Fitzmaier, and others have referred to these sections as triptychs. A triptych is a work of art which is set into three panels. The first triptych in the infancy narrative is the Annunciation triptych, talking about the announcement of the birth of Jesus, the announcement of the birth of John the Baptist. The second triptych is the birth triptych, talking about the birth of John the Baptist and the birth of Jesus. The third triptych is the appearance triptych, the appearance of John the Baptist in Galilee and the appearance of Jesus in Galilee at the, at the beginning of his public ministry. To the first two of these, as a conclusion to the infancy narrative, a narrative of the finding in the temple is appended, forming a complete conclusion to the infancy narrative. The triptychs that make up the infancy narrative, then, are the Annunciation triptych and the Birth triptych, and the appended narrative on the finding in the temple. The early ministry section contains what some scholars speak of as the Appearance triptych. The Annunciation triptych consists of the narratives of the announcement of the birth of John the Baptist, the announcement of the birth of Jesus, to which have been appended a narrative on the visitation, where the unborn John and Jesus come into each other's presence. The birth triptych consists of the narratives of the birth of John the Baptist and the birth of Jesus. Appended here is the narrative of the presentation. The infancy narrative is then brought to a close with yet another appended narrative, the finding in the temple. Here we can get a sense of the geography of Luke's infancy narrative. The texts concerning John the Baptist, the announcement of his birth, take place just outside of the city of Jerusalem, in a small village called Ein Kerem. The Annunciation of Jesus' birth to Mary takes place in the area of Galilee in a, vill in a village called Nazareth. In the Visitation merit narrative, Mary, who was just conceived, travels from Nazareth to Ein Kerem to be with her kinswoman Elizabeth for three months before returning to Nazareth. The birth narrative of Jesus, the Nativity, involves yet another cross-country journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem, where Jesus is born. Finally, the presentation takes place at the temple in Jerusalem, a short distance from Bethlehem. Now we turn to the narrative of the announcement of the birth of John the Baptist. It begins with the introduction of the key characters in the narrative, Zechariah and Elizabeth. Zechariah is described as a priest of the division of Abiah. Elizabeth is described as one of the daughters of Aaron. That is, she comes from a priestly family. Then she is described as aged, 
and barren. This is not good for a woman in the world of Zechariah and Elizabeth, where the primary social unit was the family, and where one's ancestry was of critical importance. This puts Elizabeth in the same category as Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Hannah, to mention a few in the Old Testament. Both are described as righteous before God and blameless. Zechariah and Elizabeth are, in other words, good, upright people. Continuing the announcement, we are told, is delivered by an angel of the Lord, Gabriel, who will be named later, to Zechariah, who is in the temple. Zechariah's division was on duty in the temple. Each of the 24 divisions of priests served for a period of two weeks at the temple in Jerusalem. The lot falls, and Zechariah is chosen to enter the temple that is, the holy place, and burn incense after the time of the evening sacrifice, the hour of incense. The holy place had three sacred objects in it, the altar of incense, the golden lampstand, and the table of consecrated bread, known as the showbread. The chosen priest would enter the holy place, clean the altar, and offer fresh incense. There were a rather large number of priests in each division, so it was most likely that each would have the privilege of offering this incense once and only once in their lifetime. For Zechariah, then, this was a most significant moment, but in God's plan it was to become even more significant. Zechariah therefore enters the holy place and performs his priestly duty. As he does it, the angel of the Lord appears standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Zechariah's reaction is normal for the appearance of the divine, a theophany. He's startled, troubled, and fearful. The angel comforts him, Zechariah, do not be afraid. Then he goes to give the message that he sent to deliver. Elizabeth is to conceive and bear a son, and you will call his name John. The name in Hebrew is Yohanan. Yo in a name is an abbreviation for the divine name, thus God. Hanan is a form of the verb to show favor or to grace. So the name John means God has shown favor. Indeed, God has done just that in granting the prayer of Zechariah and Elizabeth, giving them a son in their old age, who will be great before the Lord. The angel goes on to tell Zechariah other wonders about this child to be born. John was to live according to the Nazarite vow, which demanded that no alcohol was to be drunk. The hair was to remain uncut, and dead bodies were not to be touched. The vow placed John in the same rank with Samson and the prophet Samuel. Further, he will be in the spirit and power of Elijah to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Thus John embodies many of the great men of the Hebrew scriptures and is to prepare for the greatest yet to come, Jesus, the Son of God, made man. Zechariah's response to all of this is understandable incredulity. How shall I know this? And then he states the obvious. I am old and my wife is advanced in years. Many interpret this question as a request for a sign, as was common in the Old Testament birth announcement narratives. The angel announces himself now as, as Gabriel and gives Zechariah a sign but not quite what he expected. It's a sign that is also a punishment to his quest for his question. You will be silent and unable to speak until the day these things come to pass. The reason? Because you did not believe my words. Gabriel vanishes, and Zechariah, presumably quite stunned, continues the priestly ritual he has been called to perform. That ritual ends with the priest emerging from the temple after a considerable delay, 
this time due to the angelic appearance. The final part of the ritual is the imparting of the ironic blessing upon the people gathered for the evening sacrifice. However, Zechariah was unable to speak the blessing. He could only make signs and gestures. Luke tells us that the people perceived that Zechariah had had an experience of God in the temple. Upon finishing his time of service, Zechariah returned home, and a short time after that Elizabeth conceived. Then, for five months, she hid. Arnold notes that this may have been a spiritual retreat for prayer of gratitude that God has granted her a son, or it may be Elizabeth's way of respecting God's silence imposed upon Zechariah. Others see it as a demand for privacy, as God has dealt with Elizabeth in her old age. She withdraws with her secret until her pregnancy will become obvious. The scene moves from the small village of Ein Kerem to the small village of Nazareth in Galilee, from the south to the north. The elapsed time has been six months since the announcement of Ze to Zechariah. Again, the messenger is the angel Gabriel, who is sent from God to a home of a young woman named Mary. She's introduced as a virgin who is betrothed that is engaged to a man whose name was Joseph. He is of the house of David. In the modern city of Nazareth, the Basilica of the Annunciation dominates the landscape, as can be seen in this picture. Its dome can be seen from almost anywhere in the city. The interior is dominated by a huge mosaic depicting various scenes from church history. Below the upper church, in the crypt, is the Grotto of the Annunciation. This grotto commemorates the site of the home of Mary, where the angel Gabriel visited her, announcing the good news that she was chosen to be the mother of the Savior. Thus, it also commemorates the conception of Jesus, as is written in Latin on the stone on the altar, Verbum caro hic factus est. The word became flesh here, in this place. In explaining these two announcement narratives, I've been using parallel columns. The purpose is to show how similar yet different each of them is. Zechariah received the announcement of John's birth, and Mary receives the announcement of Jesus' birth. The angel Gabriel is the messenger who delivers the announcement in both narratives. The location of each is also different. Zechariah is in the temple in Jerusalem, Mary in her home in Nazareth. Finally, you will recall that Zechariah is performing his duty as a priest. Gabriel greets Mary in a most unusual manner. Hail, O highly favored one! With Zechariah, there was no greeting at all. Gabriel merely appeared. O highly favored one, or as the prayer the Hail Mary translates it, full of grace, is taken from the Greek participle kekaritomene. Here, as in several places in the Gospel, I will revert to the Greek because it gives us a much better picture of what is being said. When I do refer to the Greek, I will explain it, so it won't be all Greek to you. Kekaritomene is a perfect passive participle of the verb karitao, modifying Mary. The verb karitao is from a Greek root meaning grace. Hence, the verb means bestow grace or favor upon, favor highly or bless. A participle is an adjectival form of the verb, usually ending in ing. Thus, the basic participle modifying Mary would be Mary being endowed with grace. In this translation, we add a nuance, the passive. Mary is not the one endowing, which would be active, 
Rather, she is the one who received the endowment of grace. Hence, it is passive. With the passive, there many times is an agent who does the action. When no agent is specifically mentioned in biblical text, the agent is usually God. So we have Mary being endowed with grace by God. There is one part of this left to explain, the perfect. In Greek grammar, the perfect tense implies something which is a present effect of a past action. For instance, if yesterday you prepared a cake to be served at a dinner party tonight, that would be perfect tense. The cake exists in the present, but the work of preparing it was done yesterday. So Mary exists in the present as graced by God, but the actual gracing occurred in the past. So we can translate, Mary, who now stands in a state of being endowed with grace through the power of God. Many see that simple, well, not so simple, word as explaining the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. The reaction of Mary is similar to Zechariah. She's startled. But due to the greeting, she also wonders what the greeting could possibly mean. Gabriel's response is, to, is the same to both reactions. Do not be afraid but then adds a reiteration of the greeting to Mary, you have found favor with God. The angel Gabriel delivers his message to Mary in a similar manner to the announcement to Zechariah. Mary will conceive and give birth to a son. His name will be called Jesus. And again, the name is significant. Jesus is an English form of the Greek for the Hebrew name Yehoshuak. The first part of the name Yeho is another form of the divine name Yahweh, or simply God. The second part is from the Hebrew verb Shuak, which means to save. Hence, the name means Yahweh, or God saves. As with Zechariah's son John, his destiny is then narrated by Gabriel. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of David his father. He will rule over the house of David forever. As with Zechariah, Mary is totally taken back by this announcement. She asks, how can this be, since I do not know man? Realizing that when Zechariah asked such an innocent question, he was struck dumb. One might wait anxiously to see what will happen to Mary for her question. Nothing happens, but an answer is given to her question explaining how this can be. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. As a result, the child will be called Son of God. Mary and the hearers or readers are told from the outset exactly who this child will be. He will be no ordinary human being. He will be the Son of God, conceived by the Holy Spirit. Then Mary is informed of the pregnancy of Elizabeth, her kinswoman, despite her age. In a statement of reassurance to Mary, Gabriel notes that Elizabeth, who was thought to be sterile, is now in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. The narrative concludes with the response of Mary to the message of Gabriel. She is a servant, a doule of the Lord, and as such one who does the bidding of the Lord. Hence, she says, let it be done to me as you say. Mary accepted the role that Gabriel has offered her. In this acceptance, she becomes the primary model of faith in the Gospel of Luke. In the midst of questions, she trusts God's words th through his messenger. In the moment of saying yes, she commits to a life of motherhood, knowing that God will be with her as she lives out that commitment. With his mission complete in Mary's acceptance, the child is conceived and Gabriel departs from Mary. The first thing that Mary does upon the angel's departure is planned for a trip to visit her kinswoman to help her during her pregnancy. 
She makes the journey from, get, from Nazareth to Ein Kerem to the house of Zechariah and Elizabeth. Thus, Luke brings together the two announcement narratives and a third joining narrative known as the Visitation. Here is a picture of the mosaic behind the main altar of the upper church commemorating the Visitation. It depicts Mary, Queen of Heaven, reigning above a number of Franciscans, depicting the Franciscan custody of the Holy Land. The heavenly host are arranged above Mary, with various saints on either side. In the lower, or crypt, church, there are a number of frescoes, the most significant of which is pictured here. It's Elizabeth greeting Mary at the visitation. The Latin inscription in the arch over the fresco says, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? It captures the essence of the visitation. Upon accepting Gabriel's offer, and learning of her kinswoman's pregnancy, Mary goes with haste to her. Luke uses emphasis to show this. He lists three destinations, each more closely related to Elizabeth. He says that Mary went to the hill country, which is in the southern part of the, la of the land, and to a city of Judah, which, does, which he does not name, and finally to the house of Zechariah and Elizabeth. Upon entering, Mary greets her kinswoman. A double reaction occurs with Mary's greeting, one from Elizabeth and the other one from the babe in her womb. The babe is described as leaping from the Greek verb skirtao, meaning to leap or to jump. This recalls David's leaping with joy before the ark as it is brought into Jerusalem in 2 Samuel 16.16. 16. Just as David leapt in the presence of the Lord, so here does the infant John leap in the presence of the Lord. John is even in the womb, anticipating the position he will play in later life, as the one who will announce the presence of the Lord. Elizabeth, then filled with the Holy Spirit, exclaims, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. This is the Holy Spirit speaking through Elizabeth. This is common in narratives of birth in the Hebrew Scriptures. Elizabeth's acclamation is a blessing both of Mary and of the child. She continues, Why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? It is clear here that Elizabeth knows exactly who the child is that Mary is carrying. How she gets this knowledge is questioned, but many would see it as a revelation of the Holy Spirit. Mary then Elizabeth then recounts what has just happened. This may be Luke's hint at how Elizabeth know, knew who the child was. And then Elizabeth pronounces yet another blessing for Mary because of her trust in God's fulfillment of what God had promised. Many see this statement of Elizabeth as a contrast to her own husband's mistrust of God. In the announcement birth of John the Baptist we saw earlier, the parallel between Mary and Zechariah becomes clear here. Now comes the first of four hymns that Luke incorporates into his infancy narrative. In common parlance, it's known as the Magnificat, from the first word of the Latin text of the hymn. The opening line is, Magnificat anima mea, my soul magnifies the Lord. The other hymns are the Benedictus, or the Canticle of Zechariah, spoken at the naming of John the Baptist. The heavenly host of angels sing the Gloria in Excelsis at the announcement of the shepherds to the shepherds of the birth of Jesus. And finally, Simeon prays the Nunc Dimittis, at the presentation of Jesus in the temple. 
These hymns are more than likely pre-Lucan hymns which Luke adapted to the circumstances of his writing. This can be clearly seen when one looks at the Magnificat and compares it with the Canticle of Hannah and the Book of Samuel. This Magnificat contains several of the themes that we will find in the Gospel of Luke. For example, he has regarded the low estate of his handmaiden, speaks of Mary's situation in the Annunciation, but also announces the theme of Luke's interest in the poor, the downtrodden, and women. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly, joined to he has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty, announces Luke's theme of reversal, which will be prominent throughout the Gospel. Upon completion of the Magnificat, Luke returns to the narrative of the visitation. He notes that Mary remained with Elizabeth about three months, and then returns to her home in Nazareth. Thus, Mary returns home just before John is born. Some feel that this is strange, in that just as she would be most needed, she returns home. But others feel that her return removes her from the scene, and leaves the spotlight for John the Baptist. Having completed the first triptych of the Lucan infancy narrative, we turn now to the second, which is known as the birth triptych. This consists of the birth narrative of John the Baptist, which completes the first chapter of the, announce of the of Gospel of Luke, the birth narrative of Jesus, and the appendix of the narrative, the presentation of Jesus. Luke immediately moves to the narrative of John's birth. Now the time came for Elizabeth to be delivered, and she gave birth to a son. The major part of this narrative concerns the circumcision and naming of the child. The reaction of those around Elizabeth is joy that the Lord has shown mercy to Elizabeth allowing her to conceive and bear a son in her old age. This is a picture of the exterior of the Church of John the Baptist, which commemorates the birth of John narrated in this section of the Gospel of Luke. As you can see, it's nestled on a hillside in the town of Ein Kerem. Inside is the spot where John was born. This spot is marked by a star with a Jerusalem cross in the center, with the inscription, Hic Precursor Domini Natus Est, which translates, Here the Precursor of the Lord was born. The narrative then jumps eight days to the circumcision and naming of John. From the time of Abraham, circumcision was performed on every male child on the eighth day from birth. It was a religious ritual that marked the child's incorporation into God's covenant community. Also, the circumcised child is named, which is a bit unusual here since at this time in Judaism the custom was to give the child a name at birth. In any case, it was presumed that the child would be named after his father. Zechariah, or after one of the male relatives. Elizabeth intervenes, saying that the child will be named John, in accordance with the command given to Zechariah by the angel Gabriel, which is Elizabeth's motivation for speaking. The relatives have no knowledge of that encounter, and so they object that none of the family has the name John. So why be so insistent on that name? So the gathered assembly turns to Zechariah, making signs as to what he wished to name his son. Still unable to speak, Zechariah motions for a writing tablet and wrote the wish that he had. His name is John, to the extreme wonderment of all those gathered. But even more amazing was the fact that in that instant his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed and Zechariah speaks, blessing God. With Zechariah's believing act of naming, 
the disbelieved words of the angel come to their fruition. And in fulfillment of, 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 Zechariah, of Luke one twenty, Zechariah's curse is withdrawn. The whole gathered assembly comes to the realization that they are in the presence of God's action and respond appropriately. Fear came upon all the neighbors, Luke tells us, and they talked about these events throughout the entire region. People who hear of these wonders ponder them and ask an appropriate question. What then will this child be? The hand of the Lord is with him. Thus the events surrounding the birth, circumcision, and especially the naming of Zechariah's son John show that he is no ordinary child. He's a child destined for great things, as the angel Gabriel had pointed out in the announcement of his birth to Zechariah. The second of Luke's canticles, the Benedictus, occurs here. Unable to speak throughout the entire pregnancy of Elizabeth, Zechariah now speaks, praising God and blessing God. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has visited and redeemed his people. The canticle shows how much of what was expected through the history of Israel is now coming to fulfillment in the birth of the child who will go before the Lord to prepare his way. The narrative ends with a note that the child grew and became strong in the spirit and was in the wilderness till the day of his manifestation to Israel. The growth and becoming strong in the spirit is a typical ending to a narrative of birth. Many Old Testament characters have such growth summaries. The notation that he was in the wilderness has given rise to the theory that John the Baptist spent a significant part of his early years with the Qumran community on the shores of the Dead Sea in the Judean wilderness. The community was also known as the Essenes, who produced the Dead Sea Scrolls. Josephus, in his Jewish War, comments that the Essenes adopt other men's children, while yet pliable and docile and regard them as their own kin and mold them in accordance with their own principles. Josephus Jewish War 282. Further, John's preaching and the teaching of the Qumran Essenes hold many points in common. Both see the imminent coming of God's final salvation. Both see a key position to the prophecy of Isaiah, especially Isaiah 43. Both practice ritual washings, for example, John's baptismal ritual. In the next session, we'll look at the remainder of the infancy narrative, paying special attention to the birth narrative of Jesus, which has come to be known as the Christmas story. Then the narrative of Jesus' circumcision will be touched on. Finally, we will look at the presentation narrative, which also includes the purification of the Blessed Mother. Finally, we end with the appendix to the infancy narrative known as the finding narrative in the temple when Jesus was 12 years old. <laughs>